Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is Memphis Tigers senior tight end, Alan Cross. Two weeks from tomorrow, the Memphis Tigers will walk down Tiger Lane and into Liberty Bowl Memorial Stadium, where they will open up the 2015 season against Missouri State. After a 10-win campaign in 2014, which concluded with a victory over BYU in the Miami Beach Bowl, the excitement surrounding the program and the anticipation for the new season is arguably at an all-time high. Head coach Justin Fuente and his squad have been preparing for the season for the last few weeks, and the intensity level continues to grow as we move closer to opening kickoff. The Tigers have some huge holes to fill on defense with only three returning starters. Meanwhile, on offense, it's the deepest this unit has been since Fuente's arrival back in 2012. Led by quarterback Paxton Lynch, the Tigers' O is poised to light up the scoreboard. And a big part of it will undoubtedly be the sure-handed former walk-on, Alan Cross. The senior tight end caught 28 passes last season and scored four touchdowns. And in three seasons at Memphis, Cross has caught 11 touchdowns and rushed for another. But it's not just the numbers with Cross. It's about the leadership the chemistry he has created with Lynch, and the things he does that doesn't appear in a box score. So to say Cross is invaluable would be an understatement. Well, this is Alan's last go around, you know, and I had a really brief conversation with him um, early in the summer in the spring and said, Alan, I know in the first game that you were gonna, you're gonna try and get everybody fired up and you're gonna be ready to play, you know. Let's not wait to the first game. Uh, to show everybody that side of you. Let's make sure that they see that now. And um, I think he's feeling more comfortable with that. You know, I think he's uh, a lot like I just kind of described Moe's. You know, he's, he's been through it. He, 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 he came here and earned everything that he's, that he's ever gotten, just like Moe's did. And um, I just want him to share that, share how important that is to him, to everybody else. And I think that's leadership as well. And. Uh, try and free him of any inhibitions he may have about about that because we all know that he or Moe's are fully invested in the program. Now, Cross was not a Justin Fuente recruit, having chosen Memphis the year prior to Fuente's arrival. It was former coach Larry Porter in charge of the program when the former Millington Central standout walked on. But it was Fuente who had the vision to move Cross from long snapper to tight end and reward the preseason John Mackey Award nominee with a scholarship. The rest is what they call history. Today, the good old country boy Alan Cross joins me to preview the upcoming season, look back on a fantastic 2014 campaign, and he tells us why he likes to headbutt his teammates. And it's next on Sports Files. Alan, great to have you on the show. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for your time. Well, I know it was a great offseason for you because the team was so good last year, winning 10 games, winning a bowl game. You can walk around with that Memphis football emblazoned on your on yeah. your shirt and walk around very proudly, yeah. right? Yes, sir. We can. You know, we, 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 we uh, wrote history last year. So first time a conference championship in I don't know how many years. So it's real good to walk around the city and have people say they're proud of you. Yeah, it's been quite a while for the Tigers. You go back to the days when you started really watching them with D'Angelo Williams and Danny Winpride and the run in bowl games that people were really excited about Memphis Tiger football. They always want to see a good Tigers football yeah. squad. It just wasn't to be. And now that they have it, there's a lot of this excitement, a lot of buzz in the area, right? Yeah, there is. I think we've, we've came a long way since then. You know, we became more as a family. It's, it's been a rough road, trust me. I've, I've been here a long time, but uh, when it finally clicks, it feels really good. What do you think made it work so well last year? I think buying into Coach Fuente's process, you know, we finally all of us said, hey, man, he knows what he's doing. He's been at TCU before, he, you know, winning seasons there, conference championships there. So 
we might as well just listen to them. And I think we did, and we proved it. Did you guys, and you being one of the elder statesmen, accept him right from the get-go? And if you did, was it just a matter of, of numbers, not having the right players, not having his players yeah. to, to be able to produce? Or, or was there a, a time period when you were wondering, you know, is this guy going to be the coach yeah, we hope he will be? That, that's what the big problem was when he first got here. Not everybody bought into his process. You know, he'd always say, put your chip in each day. And some of us did and some of us didn't. You know, there was still a lot of Coach Porter guys here, you know, myself included. But a couple of us were like, hey, you know, let's buy it. Towards the end of the season, my freshman year, you know, we won that 4-0 and run and started, you know, blowing people out, so to say. And, that kind of proved to us that, you know, we could take a, a group of, you know, misfits, so to say, you know, mm -hmm. and play them together and make them a family and make a good football team. Winning and having a big season is great, mm -hmm. but sustaining that and yeah. having consistency is a whole other story. How do you do that? I think just going in to work every day, you know, like it's our last time. I know it's my last time and showing the younger guys that how important it is to to make a good brotherly bond in college football because you only do this once. You know, you only got, I don't know how many games. I remember just yesterday, I was a little freshman, just got here and now it's, you know, almost over. So that's the big key point in having a good football team is becoming a family. And chemistry is, is pivotal, right? Oh yeah, you know, we get me and Paxton and Moe's and, you know, Paxton and Moe's, Paxton and Phil Mayhew and heck, even Gabe and Paxton, they always gotta have a good connection on a good feel for what they like to do and what they don't like to do. And you know, Moe's has got to run a good route for Paxton, and Paxton's got to put him on him and everything. So. I saw you at media days for the American Athletic Conference wearing that championship ring proudly. Oh, yeah. You know, what was that moment like? That uh, Obviously, you, you shared the title, but we know uh, how outstanding it was for you guys to, to do that because even the D'Angelo years, they never won a conference championship. Yes, sir. So what was that like? And, and where's that ring normally if it's not on your hand? I was at the house and the cabinet put up, you know, on display. My daddy don't like me wearing it out, but, you know, I got to listen to what daddy says. You know, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here. But uh, it was a great moment, you know, going down there and showing the ring off to, to Tulane guys. They wanted to see it. You know, they were, they were real cool about it, you know. We wasn't trying to, you know, put it in people's faces or anything, but just, you know, just having a good time with it and being proud of it. Well, going into this season, a little bit different for you guys. You're used to being the hunter, and now, to some regards, you're the hunt it. You're picked to win the West. Mm -hmm. You are picked to finish second to Cincinnati uh, in the conference. There is a conference championship game now for the first time in the AAC. Mm -hmm. So what about uh, the, the difference now of being a program that's being pointed at by other schools, yeah. other programs that want to get you? It's, it's a lot different, you know, we got a lot of uh, young guys on the team that they're going to have to learn that to not get the big head, you know, just to keep going 1-0 and each day like Coach Fuente always tells us and just working, you know, with Coach Cutchlow, Coach Cutchlow in the weight room and watching film late at night when, you know, we're, you're tired and getting the work in and not really not think about that they voted us to win it. Think about it like we got a big target on our back and mm -hmm. we need to come together and, and fight with one another because ain't nobody, gonna, ain't nobody else going to fight with us. What's it been like for you this run? You played at Millington. You played middle linebacker. Yep. And now you're not only a productive member of the Tigers, you are one of the top tight ends going into your senior season in the entire country. Talk about that transition, first of all, going from defense to offense. But yep. second of all, when you were at Millington, where did you see yourself five years down the road? Well, when I first started playing ball, you know, I just played defense. I like playing defense and just like hitting people. I didn't really like blocking, but uh, I saw myself probably, you know, playing linebacker at Arkansas State or, you know, anything like that. That's what I was going to do before Coach Porter called me and asked me to come take a visit here. And, uh, you know, I fell in love with Memphis, you know, and I was wanting to be close to my daddy because that's really all I got left. You know? Right. So, so you could see all your games. Yeah. And... So I said, might as well just stay here and just be close to daddy. And I uh, walked on as a you know, long snapper, defensive scout team guy. And Coach Fuente got here. He said, hey, you, know, you, you play tight end? I said, I said, no, but I'll give it a shot. So I went in the spring, his first spring, his third string, and came out the starter and been starting ever since. What's been the, the hardest thing and the easiest thing in the transition to 
being a pass catcher to playing tight end, not only blocking, but also catching touchdowns, oh, yeah. which you have done? I don't, I really don't know. I mean, it kind of just came natural to me. I don't, I don't really know where I got good, decent hands from or whatever, but uh, that was probably the hardest thing, running, getting to run routes and learning how to, you know, get your hands inside blocking because playing defense, all you got to do is just wrap them up mm -hmm. and just take them to the ground. But that was probably the hardest part. Well, you've played sports all your life, all sports. You played yeah. baseball. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't in high school, but growing up, you played yeah. baseball, basketball, football. Mm -hmm. You have to have the good eye-hand coordination oh, yeah. to play all those sports. I'm sure that helped. Yeah, it did, you know, especially with baseball. I couldn't hit the ball pretty good, but, you know, <laughs> when, I, when I did, it would go pretty far. So I think that was a big, big uh, attribute to catching the football as well. You talked about having that, that defensive mentality. You wanted to hit people. Yeah. You didn't want to block. You wanted to hit people. Mm -hmm. As a tight end, you certainly could still hit people as yeah. well, but you also catch touchdowns. I heard about your ritual about butting the helmets. Oh, uh, man. Tell me about that because we've seen some of the, 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 the war wounds oh, yeah. after that. You what, st yeah. still see it. What's that all about? I don't know. I just started doing it this year, and, uh, you know, Bobby had his thing. When, when we get done doing warm-ups, you know. He, Bobby McCain? Yeah, he okay. comes in and does his little talk. And uh, I do it before warm-ups. And I don't know why, I just did it one day. And everybody just got, you know, real hyped up, you know, ready to play the ready to play the game. And I just kept going with it. Then well, we, well, give us specifics. How many guys are you knocking helmets with? Uh, Who are you doing that with? I don't know, maybe like three or four guys. Are you worried you're going to knock yourself out before a game? No. <laughs> Does coach have any issues with it? No, he doesn't. He doesn't. He just says, quit being, he always messes with me. He says, quit being dumb. <laughs> but he don't, he don't never tell me to stop, so. And it fires up not only you, but your teammates oh, yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. I don't know why, but it just does. I, I, you obviously have a, a nice relationship on and off the field with your quarterback, Paxton Lynch, yeah. who is getting a lot of preseason accolades, mm -hmm. uh, well-deserved. Oh, yeah. What is he like? Oh, he's a good old boy. You know, he comes from a good family. He's got a good mama and daddy down there in Florida. Uh, he likes, you know, me and him go play golf sometimes, you know, just cut up, have fun, and hung out. I mean, we hang out a lot, you know, just sit at the house, play video games, or watch TV or whatever, you know. But um, he's a good guy. You know, he's got a good, a good head on his shoulders. I don't think he's going to get the big head any with these awards. You know, he's real humble about himself. He works hard in the weight room, watches film by himself, you know, always understands the game plan. You know, when I, when I don't know, when I get confused on something, I'm like, hey, we're doing this, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, without him, sometimes, you know, I, I might mess up. Right. The big question going into this season, I would think, is defensively. You lose eight starters. We mentioned Bobby McCain and mm -hmm. Tank Jakes and Martin Effetti, and the list goes on and on and on. Yeah. How do you replace them? I think the guys that we got in, in their spots right now are, are going to be good guys for us. You know, they might not be as great as they were, but they could be just as good, you know. But uh, I think the way you replace them is, is – Putting them in good uh, situations. Coach Scott will put them in good situations, you know, bring them, you know, blitzes from here and there, getting the offense confused. And, you know, everybody has their good and bads. And, you know, so using their goods to a good ability as a defensive coordinator will be a good part in replacing them. How, fe how confident do you feel in the offense that you can score on anybody? I feel real confident. You know, Pac it's gonna, it all starts with Pax, you know, making good reads, making good decisions with the football. You know, knowing when to tuck and run when the time needs to be. And receivers, you know, we got good receivers making good plays out there. And a big part of it we're going to emphasize in the camp is uh, perimeter blocking, you know, getting the ball in the perimeter more, which we did okay with last year, but we need to do better with that. Who do you believe is your rival in this conference? Man, I, I really don't know, to be honest with you. Is there one team above the rest that you want to beat? Probably Cincinnati just because everybody puts them up on a pedestal every year, and we kicked their butts last year, so. You did? Oh, yeah. It always seems like throughout the history there's been that comparison mm -hmm. between Cincinnati and Memphis. Yeah. Even with the cities, not just the athletic program at the universities, but with mm -hmm. the cities, very comparable. When they talk about conference shift and going somewhere else, they always compare the two, so yeah. it's, it's uh, quite understandable why you would say Cincinnati. Uh, on the schedule this year, and a newcomer to the conference is Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, you won't have to worry about what they do on offense because you play offense, yeah. but they are a different team with the option, oh, yeah. with a fine quarterback in Keenan Reynolds. They bring in um, just, it's a whole different aura to them being yeah. a, a, uh, an academy, service academies mm -hmm. program. What does that mean to have an, a, a Naval Academy football program in your conference? Man, it, mean, it means a lot. I met the, we met Keenan Reynolds and a defensive lineman, me and Wynn did up at uh, Media Day. 
great guys, great guys, you know. You got to respect for what they do for us, you know, me and you, you know, when time's called, they got to no go. Question. So, but uh, it means a lot, you know, we've got a different type of offense style in the conferences. You know, I think everybody really runs a spread and high tempo and they're kind of going to slow it down and run the read ops and triple ops and everything, which is it's pretty interesting to watch. You know, them and Georgia Tech are really the only two that I know it does it really well. But uh, it's going to be tough to stop, you know, but I think Coach Scott has something for them. Maybe the biggest name, probably the biggest name on the schedule, non-conference, is Ole Miss. You get them at home. Mm -hmm. They're a regional team. Probably guys on that roster that you've played against in high school or oh, yeah. in college that you know from the area. Mm -hmm. What would that be like? Because we know it's going to be an incredible crowd to be able to. And, and you, did, you played last year, of course, you played them pretty, pretty well, and then they, they kind of yeah. took over in the fourth quarter. But that was down there. This is at home. Mm -hmm. Your chance to really make some noise. What's it going to be like? It's going to be a fun game. Good atmosphere, like you said. Hopefully, that you know it's packed to the top. You know, I've only seen it packed to the top one time, and I was a freshman when Mississippi State came Liberty Bowl. So, it's fun playing in the atmospheres, and I, I think that'll be a, play a big part in the game. You know, it might be more than you know more them than it is us, but you know, I, it really doesn't matter to be honest. And uh, we just got to go out, just execute the game plan. Coach Fuente will have us good, a good game plan for the game, and we just got to execute. How important is it that the staff, other than the loss of, there was two coaches that left, including defensive coordinator Barry Odom, but on the offensive side, and for the most part, the staff has been um, in place. They haven't left. Yeah. How, how important is that to a player? Oh, it's very important when, you know, you got a, a coach that's been with you all four years of high, or I mean, excuse me, a college. Right. You know, it's a, it plays a big part not only in football but you know in personal life you know because you tell them, once you get close to them you start you know talking to them a little bit more and trusting them more and more and things like that and then when they leave then you got to meet a whole new different person which is, is pretty tough I know the cornerbacks have I think when Bobby was here I think he's had three or four different coaches mm, there's no stability is, yeah which is tough but I mean it's part of college football you know but I think that's the big part just on a personal level right. You know? What are your goals, both team-wise, individual goals for this upcoming season? To repeat, you know, repeat as a conference championships and go to another bowl game, hopefully a bigger bowl game. But, you know, that's on down the road. We'll cross that bridge when it gets built. And, uh, but as personally wise, just, just becoming a, a more vocal leader, you know, uh, on and off the field. When guys are doing something wrong off the field, you know, hey man, get in the truck you know we don't need to be here we need to go home you know just things like that it, it seems like as we talked about earlier the chemistry the cohesiveness you guys like playing with each other mm -hmm. that people don't really care if this guy caught the touchdown or that there. guy caught the touchdown there's there's no selfishness mm -hmm. that's that's uh that was a big part in last year you know coach Fuente put a big emphasis on that you know playing for each other you know not playing for me playing for you and uh, playing for the city and playing for what 901 stands for and just things like that. And that's what brings us closer together as, as brothers. And just when somebody like Phil scores a touchdown or Moe's, you know, I'm just excited as, as he is. So, Real quick, any thoughts uh, with another big season, productive season, that you know, possibly you're going to get your crack at playing on Sundays? I'm not really worried about that right now, you know. I'm worried about first day of camp tomorrow, really. If it happens, it happens. If it don't. It ain't gonna hurt my feelings one bit. Alan, you're off the hot seat, but we're not done our interview yet. We like to wrap up things with something called Five for the Road. So I need a quick answer, mm -hmm. simple questions. I'll start off with your favorite professional sports team, any sport. Denver Broncos. Denver Broncos. Favorite pro athlete of all time. Peyton Manning. And no hesitation there. Mm -hmm. Favorite music, musician, or genre of music? What do you like to listen to? I like country and rap. You know. Country and rap, yeah. not country rap. No, no, no I not, hate not the stuff. combination. No. Uh, give me an artist from country and give me an uh, give me a rapper. I'm gonna go with uh, maybe Kenny Chesney and okay. probably Juicy J. Who do you list, like to listen to maybe before the game? Do you like to listen to the music in your oh, headphones? Yeah, Juicy J. Juicy J. Oh, yeah. um, favorite movie of all time? The Water Boy. <laughs> can you can you impersonate Bobby Boucher? Yeah, I can. Come on, know. give me give me give me a second in that camera on Bobby Boucher. <laughs> Bobby, you know, it's me. I'm here to play football. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> and then finally, your favorite television show. Uh, I'd have to go with probably The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I've watched that ever since I was a little kid. 
believe it or not, Fresh Prince of Bel Air and Martin get answered a lot of times when uh, I ask that question. Mm -hmm. Alan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, man. Have a great senior season. We look forward to watching you out there. I'll be there. We'll take a break. Overtime is on the way. Across from Shelby Farms on Walnut Grove Road is a hidden gem in Memphis. It's Shelby Farms BMX, where some of the best riders in the Mid-South compete on a track that was completely refurbished a year ago. Memphis is one of only 370 tracks in the entire country. And all you need is a bike, a prude bicycle helmet, long sleeves and long pants. The rest is up to you. It's a rush of adrenaline every moment. And we recently paid a visit to the Shelby Farms BMX track to catch some of the action. BMX racing is a uh, is a competitive sport. It's a family sport. It's a individual sport that you uh, sprint over a quarter mile track on average uh, with uh, obstacles in the way and bank turns and it's uh, everybody eight people in the gate start out whoever crosses the finish line first wins. We have multiple le levels of uh, BMX. It's, uh, we get st start out the bottom, it's novice, and uh, then you go to intermediate, and then the expert levels. And then after expert, you, you can turn pro and race uh, professionally, and it's an Olympic sport. Uh, you, can, you can go to the Olympics, uh, you can go to the Pan American Games. Uh, all, uh, racing's all over the world. BMX is a worldwide sport, and it's, it's huge in other countries, very big in other countries. When I was a kid, BMX racing was a huge, huge sport. And uh, it just it was it was always attractive to me. I've played all kind of uh, team sports and just the individual sports where you know you're the only person on the track, you know you only hold you accountable. So that's that's what I always liked about it. I started uh, racing in Texas in 1981, and I raced competitively uh, as a kid. And uh, when I got to be an adult, I had to quit, you know. And uh, a few years later, after I had established a family, I started back racing at the age of 38. And, I'm about to be 44, and uh, I race at the expert level. I race all over the nation. I race locally here every uh, Saturday and Tuesday nights, and love the kids. I like being an example for the kids, and and uh, just having fun with them. Um, I'm like I said, I'm 43 years old, and and uh, this 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 is very labor intensive. And uh, in the gate, I'm, my heart resting heart rate's around 50 to 55. When I cross the finish line, about 38 seconds later. A quarter mile, my heart rate's in the 160s. The class bike is a 20-inch wheeled bike. Uh, and they have every age and every uh, proficiency on that bike, and that's called a class bike. It's a 20-inch BMX bicycle. And the cruisers are 24-inch uh, wheel bicycles, and uh, there's different classes in that, and um, all the proficiency, proficiencies race in the, on those 24s. We wear full protective like motocross gear. We wear elbow pads, knee pads. Uh, we, a lot of... Uh, Intermediate, expert, and pro levels wear the clip-in shoes, so we're locked to our pedals. The novice levels, they ride in regular tennis shoes on flat pedals, and uh, we wear full carbon fiber protective helmets and gloves, and we're basic, essentially racing on asphalt turns and, and as hard as dirt as you can imagine. I've seen as, as low as like a three-year-old racing, but the, 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 the lowest class is five and under, and it goes all the way to 46 plus expert on the 20 inch and then I think 60 and over on Cruiser. This track's been here since 87 and uh, man, over the last two years we've really done a lot of work to it thanks to our, our uh, track operators. They've really put a lot of hard work into this track man and made this track a, a, a na national level track. I mean people, I've had a, a friends of mine come in from Tucson and were at awe about this track and they loved it. We race every Saturday and Tuesday nights and we practice on Thursday nights. And if we have a rain delay and, and we miss a Tuesday or a Saturday, we'll make it up on that Thursday night. So that three nights a week, uh, set, you know, during the week, we'll, we'll uh, be out here. So what did you get a trophy in? What, what place and what class? Intermediate and third. What do you like about racing? Jumping. 
I heard a rumor that you were racing against kids older than you. Is that right? Yeah. How old are they? Mm, ten. And you're how old? Seven. And you took third place. That's pretty good. Thanks. What do you like about racing? Um, I like the bumps. And that it's fun. Is it hard? Eh. Not really. Before we go, the Redbirds announced that they will honor the Grizzlies with a grit grind night at AutoZone Park on August 31st. The Birds will wear commemorative blue and gold Grizzlies themed jerseys. Grizzguard Tony Allen will throw out the first pitch, later sign autographs, and the jerseys will be auctioned off for charity. And that'll do it for now. Next week, we're back to our usual day and time of Thursday at 8.30 with a look at the upcoming SEC football season. Until then, have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO.